record on this. Um, All right. Got it. Okay. Got it? okay. Yeah. So um, um, this is Desiree Wood from Real Women in Trucking, and I'm a truck driver, and we founded this organization, and I'm talking today with Tracy, who is actually a port driver in Long Beach. She's a member, and she is also a um, previous award recipient as a trucking industry trailblazer. Uh, she has quite a story. That's how we came to know her when she got her award. Um, she was a shop steward. And so we've been getting like inundated with media outlets asking us about these supply chain issues. And then we've seen drivers trying to spread these conspiracy theories they hear from other <laughs> driver groups about what's going on at the port. And I grew up in Southern California. My dad was a fisherman. The playground that I had when I was a kid was the Port of Oakland, the Port of Long Beach, San Pedro, Port Wainimi, um, mm -hmm. Channel Islands, Morro Bay, you know. So we were in the water a lot. My dad had boats that were like 100 feet long. So we were in this dock space. He actually ran the California Responder, which is the oil relief boat. And it's, I think it's 200 feet. So we were in the area where the freight ships were and we saw the population grow a lot in Southern California. I was born in 1965. I was born in Los Angeles, lived at Venice Beach. So we saw the growth where we were always moving a little bit north because the population was exploding and all the rich people wanted to live at the beach and they want all the poor people to move away so they can have all the beach. But you have these ports that are freight centers that are industry, that are commerce, that still need to move out of the state. And people don't understand that. And they don't understand how that congestion and lack of planning for all of this urban sprawl has just made a bad situation worse. Mm -hmm. And so now we are where we are from years and years of neglect. And one thing that I had pointed out in a post a couple of days ago was we already did a Panama Canal expansion. Mm -hmm. We already have dredged out ports on the East Coast so that if, truck, uh, if freight ships wanted to avoid sitting offshore for the very limited dock space, um, they could go through the Panama Canal. Right now, a lot of freight sits offshore. It's been sitting offshore waiting for its appointment time for a long time, and Tracy's going to talk more about that. There's always been a bunch of ships sitting offshore waiting for dock space to unload. Um, so now you have a situation where you actually could bring them through the Panama Canal and unload them elsewhere and avoid the whole crowd, you know, un sit offshore for two weeks, unload, get on a team truck and then get across the country with just kind of an antiquated way. People say, oh, it's going to cost so much more. I don't think so. You know, I see I was in a, a meeting yesterday. The ports in Florida have seen a 55 percent increase of their traffic, um, that's good. They could they could handle a lot more. There's also ports in Texas, Savannah, Charleston, um, and others that have been dredged out to accommodate some of these ships. So um, we're gonna now look. So so the technology is there, is what I'm saying. That we could have some relief. Um, and then I was at a event um, in Nashville, Tennessee, and met a guy named Steve Peasley, who gave a presentation on this thing called Wicked Hyper, which is a hyperloop. It's, a, it's an idea. It's not um, implemented yet. Anyway, what this system is, is basically um, a crane that lifts up the containers from the ship, puts them on a hyperloop, which is a rail that already exists from the ports, and it runs 
they never touch the ground and they come 50 miles out from the port on a rail to an inland port. And that is where they would go through customs and cross docks and over the road drivers would take them and, and local drivers would move those containers around so that they didn't even need to go near the port anymore. So you're actually moving the whole party 50 miles inshore, um, inland if to an inland port that's uh, specifically designed you know, for all of this and take all that congestion out of these overloaded port areas that have no more where wharf space and they never will. And it's never going to get more real estate because real estate is very expensive by the ocean. So that's my preface to all of this. And uh, Tracy, I'm going to let you go ahead and just first of all, start out, tell us about your career as a truck driver and how long you've been working down there in Long Beach. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi. Hello, everybody. Um, I was born and raised down here in the harbor area. And um, I've watched the port go from, you know, uh, three or four terminals to boom, all it is today, you know. Um, I've been working down there uh, since, I think I started in 2001. So um, this year is like tw my 20 year anniversary. And um, so I know a lot of friends and family that have gone through, you know, working down there. Um, uh, uh, I know a lot of intricacies and um, uh, um, there's not much I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, the, um, the terminals and everything, the whole area. Um, so go ahead with everything, Desiree. Yeah. So, so you have a lot of experience with the ports. You were, I think when we first, um, uh, met you that you had, um, um, you know, you were there when the USA did the whole expose on the port drivers and how they were having these lease trucks and they weren't okay. getting paid. Talk a little bit about that so people understand what some of the situations are with the ownership and all of that with these trucks. Okay, um, yes, I, um, so the company I, I, I'm with um, went in union, um, particularly Teamsters and um, uh, um, I, you know, somewhere along the line, I, you know, began, you know, started to get active and that's when I was uh, elected a steward there. And um, um, this was about six, five, well, about six years ago. And prior to that, my experience had been one of these, um, well, actually I had my own truck to begin with, with just, it was a, a cab over Freightliner. And um, I love that truck. We was over the grapevine rolling, but, <laughs> Uh, um, you know, the clean air truck program came through and um, we had to get rid of all our old trucks. And um, so uh, I went down to the um, air, Co air commission board and made an application for one of the clean trucks, new trucks coming out. And um, there was no consideration being a minority, a woman, and um, my credit score wasn't there. And I had no um, capital, you know, saying to go out and just, you know, buy, buy a, you know, a truck on my own. So, um, you know, we were kind of forced into um, the lease agreements where the big companies got the trucks and would sublease to us. And um, at that time, at that time, we had no choice because we didn't have any background as to any other options, but to trust the companies that we were with. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they, they tricked us into fighting for them and, you know, they're going to get the trucks and then we don't have to worry. And all we have to do is work. And then after five years or six years or seven years, whatever it may be, we would own the trucks mm -hmm. free and clear. And what we found going into it was um, as you, as a person would begin to get a couple of years in, halfway through the term, you know, the company would come up with any excuse to terminate somebody. They take the same truck and they re, re, uh, uh, lease it to the next person that came along. And so years and years of uh, uh, 
input, you know, blood, sweat, and tears, you know, were yanked out from under our feet, basically. And um, with me, I ended up getting sick. Um, I had to be out for a year, um, you know, for various reasons. And, um, you know, I had to spend that year taking care of myself, healing, and, and, you know, in order to come back, I had to fight. I really had to, the fight of my life to come back to work. But, um, you know, the uh, corruption and the, the wage theft and the, you know, abuse, you know, of the whole entire system, uh, you know, I'm not going to call names and this and that because it was industry wide as far as the sub lease on these trucks are concerned. And so when I came to the union, a position, um, they introduced me to how to go to some of these meetings and, and start, you know, being active and, and be heard on, you know, because these are the people that, you know, set the terms for, you know, getting these grants for these trucks, you know, and they needed to know how we were being used and abused. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the the Air Resources Board, California Air Resources Board, you know, well intentioned. They wanted to clean up the air. People were complaining in Long Beach. They were having lung problems and pollution, and uh, and uh, that all sounds good on the surface. I know from growing up in Southern California, the Santa Monica Mountains are there, and they hold the pollution in, and it just like like a bowl of brown soup. Uh, that's just the geography of the state. And you have not just ships, but trucks and cars. And, and it's not a good, there's not a great way for it to escape. So that was sort of the, the I reasoning behind the clean ports project. And a lot of these well-intentioned programs sound really great on the surface until you realize the little guys who are just trying to make a living are get mowed down. And so that's mm -hmm. what happened with this program where they made some grants. They said, oh, um, we'll make some grants to help you get new trucks so that they're not polluters. Uh, but then all the big companies came in and swept them up before the little guys could even figure out how to fig do the paperwork or qualify or anything. So that that was a huge that was a bomb right there. Um, and then and then here we saw the USA uh, showing that the. the the people are um, in these lease scams, really, where they're working all the time for the truck and then they're not getting the title. And I think some of the paychecks that we saw where the people were getting told that they had to work 20 hour shifts and then their paycheck was nothing to even take home. And it was just repulsive. And we do know these lease schemes are nationwide. They're not they're not um, just in the ports, but we really got a a big picture and California right away went and started making some legislation about this. Um, and that's where some of the drivers have been kind of uh, Stockholm syndromed into buying <laughs> the industry's rhetoric that that uh, paying drivers for their time is communism or something. And um, we, be honest, you cannot make money being paid by the mile when you're driving 20 miles an hour trying to get in and out of these areas. So you got to pay by the hour. You can't pay by the mile anymore um, when you're asking people to go in these, these areas. So as an over the road driver, you know, on my 11 hour shift, if I'm in the Southwest where it's open highway and the speed limit's 80 miles an hour, I can get like 700 miles in. Oh, that's a nice day. But as soon as I get into Southern California, the speed limit is 55 in the desert. And that's when the, you have open highway. And then you get in is uh, anywhere close to an urban area and you're at 45, 25, 15 mm -hmm. at a dead standstill. So mm -hmm. you're not getting paid when the wheels aren't turning. I, mm -hmm. I don't think it is outrageous to ask for truck drivers to be paid for all their time and by the hour. So that's where that led to. So that eventually made you go on to be a company driver, right? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I get paid uh, as soon as I clock in. That's uh, for my inspection, you know, the uh, my cl cleanup, you know, I clean my truck every day, the spray it down, uh, 
coronavirus, everything. And um, um, my breaks, I get a 30 minute off off clock and I get 30 minutes on, on clock. And, um, you know, it's, it's easy. I, I mean, I just uh, show up, do my job and I go home. You know, mm-hmm. there's no headache. There's no, I don't have to worry about a mechanic. I don't have to worry about fuel, you know. And mm-hmm. um, uh, we have, I would say, you know, decent pay. My, my group was the first ones that actually, you know, are doing drayage, you know, well, actually the second one that broke the $30 an hour threshold. Oh, wow. Okay. That's yeah. good. That's good. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's a lot of drivers out there that aren't even making 20 an right. hour and some that aren't even making 15 and they're right. being asked to work hundred hours a week and people need to know that. So, yeah. um, Okay, so going on to, let's just say with the pandemic, I I got to see you at the beginning of the pandemic (laughs) because we went and passed out PPE down there in your neighborhood. (laughs) And I brought a carload out there and I gave you some to pass out to some of the other drivers. Um, Let's talk about what happened when the pandemic, what what went down. Okay, Um, what I've seen... um... Uh, um, is that this buildup that, that, you know, crisis mode, it's been coming, it's been a long time coming. I mean, you know, um, due to the pandemic, um, the warehouses have been having uh, outbreaks. And so they've had to um, go follow the OSHA, O-S-H-A, you know, the- um, OSHA, the, the, yeah, reduced- in, uh, a re- reduced uh, employment staff for social distancing you mean like yeah right right so they uh, uh, have been operating basically on skeleton crews um you know uh, um they can only have so many people you know on, on a container to unload it and then uh translate it onto a 53 for you guys you know mm-hmm. so you know steadily over the past year you know uh, uh, the backup has been happening and uh, the equipment, the container, the chassis, you know, and all that has been slowly, you know, backing up. That's, um, that's, uh, I would say, indicator number one. When you don't have the turnaround times that we used to have, um, you know, nothing, nobody uh, 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 thought about, you know, saying this ultimate result. Do um, you want me to just go ahead and start going or do you want me to go slow so you can ask questions as I go? Yeah, no, you're, you're doing great. You're doing great. Explain okay. about the chassis situation. So I don't think a lot of people realize when you're picking up a container from the port, what does that involve? Okay. Now the chassis situation, um, actually a couple of years, maybe three years ago, the terminals were, were coming down with the um, new rules that was... Um, asking these companies the trucking companies um to start getting their own chassis you know the best way i could put it is uh, i'll get them off the the the, the, the bottle you know and because a lot <laughs> of the chassis <laughs> come back abused abused and you know saying and broken and um the terminals operate on a, a day-by-day type of deal you know basically they do have permanent people but you know, every day they order so many workers, you know, and the way the, the, the chassis normally move and in and out and this and that and the rate that they come back broken, I mean, it doesn't make sense. I don't think they can hire enough mechanics mm. and all the parts, you know, saying to actually get everything fixed very quickly, you know, mm-hmm. um, because the chassis, they're, they're all different types and different brands and, you know, and they have, they need different parts. So that's another um, storm that's been brewing and, and pile up and everything. Um, and I also mentioned yesterday that, you know, a lot of these workers that work the, the terminals, the truck drivers in particular, you know, nobody's educating them on equipment care. Um, you know, I've seen them, you know, you can drag a chassis, you know, a little bit to pull it out. But, you know, the way that I see them doing it, like, you know, dr- uh, uh, cranking the legs all the way down to the low goes up, you know, and then leaving it like that. And then 
the next person comes along and has to drag it and it, it damages the landing gear. And that really, really, really has been a hardship of mine this whole time working with um, containers. You know, um, the land, the crank handles are, have, have worn, you know, saying my back and my, my shoulders and, you know, being a woman, you know, saying trying to deal with this. And I just wish, you know, I, I'm thinking about doing myself a, a writing a book, an instructional. <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. Welcome to, you know, saying Harvard work, you know, this is what you need to do. This is how you take care of things so that, you know, saying we can keep moving. Yeah. You know. But right now it's just whoever from wherever, you know, saying uh, we see companies right now, no experience necessary. Just come on down. If you got a class, A, let's go, let's go, let's go. You know, uh -huh. but nobody, you know, uh, 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 thinks about trying to educate some of the, you know, these people. And on top of that, you know, looking at the terminals point of view, you know, they spend a lot of money fixing these chassis, mm -hmm. you know? And that's an, an, an added expense that they shouldn't have to be going through. You know what I'm saying? If a little bit of education would be going, going on, you yeah. know? Mm -hmm. Because ultimately all these extra charges and fees and everything ends up on us, the consumers. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And you know, everything's connected. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's it with the chassis. <laughs> <laughs> so... Is everybody now at the port being paid by the hour or some of them, what is the incentive for them to rush and just like, I, I mean, I know for, I know for me being an over the road driver, only being paid by the mile. Um, when I worked for a big fleet and we had to go look for a trailer and they're like, okay, um, go get a trailer over in that lot. And you go mm -hmm. over there and there's a big field of trailers and you got to find the ones for your company. You can't just take anyone. You got to find the ones you're specifically for your company. And there's no rhyme or reason to where they are. And then you got to do an inspection on them. And like you said, when some other driver has it, they don't care. It's not their property. They, they don't take care of it. And they're certainly not going to write it up for maintenance because that <laughs> takes time out of their day and they're not getting paid by their time. So yeah. you do end up with crap. And then you're like, okay, if I take this thing to the shop right now, I'm going to lose a day of work. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, it's going to, you know, mess up my whole schedule and what I have planned for this weekend or whatever. And, um, or I could just kind of like hope I don't get busted driving this piece of crap. Um, and, and that's the truth of the matter, because that's, yeah. that's how it is in some, some companies they have, they run crap, they have crap, but what you're talking about is that there's like this community chassis pile and then the terminal's always getting stuck with the bill for all these mm -hmm. multiple drivers. So there's like a, just a, a mess there. Mm -hmm. When they get trained, they don't get any training on or consequences maybe of mm -hmm. that th this this chassis. And I've heard this from another member that we have that is a port driver in Houston. She said that's almost the hardest part of her job is finding a chassis that's roadworthy. That's yeah. where she spends the bulk of her time. So. Right. So moving on from the chassis thing, I saw you posting an article about then the crane operators who <laughs> actually bring the container down and put it on the chassis. So what, what's about, what about them? You know, um, that article, you know, I, I don't, let me, I can't say that word, <laughs> yeah. was, but basically was a, a, a small group of guys that uh, obviously was having a, um, bright session that's a better word to use and they, all they did is oh it's the cranes it's the cranes you know but like I, I, i'm trying to say there's so many factors to the problem um you know the like i said earlier the the, the terminals order so many people to work per day you know and if they have a boatload of trucks coming in to pick up which seems like they should order more people you know um obviously the the delay time is going to be you know saying extended but you know that's a balance that that is between labor that's big labor and the terminals you know and the truck drivers have forever 
you know, saying suffer the consequences. This is nothing new, mm -hmm. you know, because of course the terminal wants to move as much freight as possible, just spending the least amount of money as possible. That's business. Mm, okay. You know? So they might, they might, the terminal might say, we realize we need 200 people here today, but we're going right. to call in just a hundred because we just we'd rather work these people as hard as possible and save some money on labor costs <laughs> they might bring 150 you know 150 when they need 200 <laughs> so some of it some of it's deliberate and it's not truck drivers it's other labor that's that's getting those containers right you know and you know with that with the other labor you know you know, my biggest gripe with them, you know, they're hard workers too. You know, sure, you know, everybody, you know, every group or, or, or section has, you know, saying good and bad. But, you know, what I see uh, I would, with the years of, of dealing with, with this whole situation is a lack of unity across the whole industry. You know, they fight for, everybody's fighting for themselves as, you know, compartments. You know, mm. dock workers are, are, you know, they're, they're, you know, ganged up over here. The truck drivers, they're ganged up over here. The mechanics, they're ganged up over here. You know what I'm saying? The warehouses are, workers are over there. You know, if everybody looked out for each other in a sense of brotherly love, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Where even the, the lowliest warehouse worker at least got a decent day's pay for a decent day's work, you know? Uh, a whole lot of stress and a whole lot of uh, problems would would, would dissipate. Mm. You know, yeah. um, you know, if 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 you know, we all looked up. I mean, a a, a a container is a container. You know, whatever's in the container is that same thing from the manufacturer to the ship to the docks to the truck to the warehouse to, until it's on the shelf or at somebody's house. Mm -hmm. You know. The, the the whole process needs to be looked through as as one unit yeah it's a supply chain and right. it's got and it's got a flow because one broken <laughs> link and it falls apart so right so uh so the other um uh i don't know if you want to talk about this was that sort of the wild west of why is why is it so concentrated at the, at the long beach port we have oh yeah you know we have up north we have down south i know even ensenada has reinforced their port i lived in ensenada for a, a little bit of time in 2011 and mm -hmm. um, observed that there was a lot of american student fleets coming down to pick up freight at the ensenada mm -hmm. port which had been um completely renovated and the reinforced concrete and beautiful mm. facility um yeah. uh a lot of people don't realize that our american trucks go down there and send students to do that um mm -hmm. it's only 70 miles south of san diego mm -hmm. so that's an opportunity but why why do these ships want to stay right there where your port is okay um <laughs> here we go um <laughs> Okay. Um, dun, 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 dun. Okay. Um, yeah, I had mentioned yesterday to you that, you know, I've noticed that um, with the corruption and, and abuse, um, there's a reason, which is the reason why these companies and the shipping uh, uh, manufacturers love LA and Long Beach because LA and Long Beach still is the wild, wild west of the industry. Um, you can get a container with on these crappy chassis and and and, and dangerous as heck to uh, uh, the, the 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 motoring public, all the way uh, to the grapevine, uh, all the way to um, what's that, Victorville? Mm -hmm. Before mm -hmm. you hit a scale, mm -hmm. you know, and um, so they're getting away with you know not just the trucking companies are abusing the drivers. So, so are the, the, um, the companies that's ordering these overweight containers, you know, and mm -hmm. what I was saying is that our local cities have been suffering the brunt 
you know what I'm saying? And being stuck with the bag of all these road repairs. LA has the worst streets. I mean, we're second to Mexico, you know, mm-hmm. uh, on, you know, the potholes, the, 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 you know, it's ridiculous. It mm-hmm. really is. And um, with that, you know, I wanted to mention a call, you know, I, I was thinking last night, what should I call this? And, and I, I thought, it, oh, how about fix LA? <laughs> fix LA. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and, um, you know, with that, you know, I was thinking, you know, if all port traffic was d- diverted, all inbound port tra- traffic was diverted, like let's say on the 103 freeway, which is underdeveloped, um, uh, 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 it would take, you know, say a lot of that congestion off our local city's uh, freeway. You know, my, my, my stepmom, She's scared to death. She won't drive a freeway in LA, you know, because it's mm-hmm. that dangerous, mm-hmm. you know, and that's because of the wage theft. You know, it's all it's all tied in together. The wage mm-hmm. theft, the, the stress, the uh, uh, they got to hurry up and get these loads out. The drivers that are underpaid and getting robbed, you know, they're they're set into a desperado type of mentality mm. where they feel like they got to practically run everybody over to get that load delivered. Yeah. You know, and um, they're, they're, you know, I've been on that side of the aisle too, you know what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. I've had to work illegal hours and, um, and the whole nine yard to get, to get, you know, saying enough money to my truck bills paid and get enough money to pay my housing and, you know, saying my bills too, you yeah. know, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm not afraid to say that, you know, I, I've been on that side too. Mm-hmm. So, you know, um, like I mentioned, the 103 freeway um, would really, really, if that could be uh, um, built out to where it connects to the 405 freeway and the 91, it would take a lot of pressure off our, our local streets, you know, and then put some enforcement in there at a scale, you know, so that these chassis and, and um, this equipment and these trucks can get cleaned up. I mean, you know, some of the, the way some of these trucks are, you know, with bumpers hanging off and, you know, I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. You know, why run a truck and you can't take it to the mechanic to get it fixed? You know, mm-hmm. um, they're having accidents and they're, they're uh, duct taping, uh, 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 getting rope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, every day, every day I'm seeing this mm-hmm. every day, you know, yeah. and, you know, and it's, it's actually a public safety crisis yeah. that's going on here. And that's all because of these people, you know, and the bulk of them are lowly, you know, immigrants, you know, LA is a, a, a melting pot of, of, you know, saying all, all races are represented here mm-hmm. and, you know, and there should be no way that if you can't afford to fix or make repairs on your truck, you know, uh, why, you know, even, why even do it, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. but if, like I said, if enforcement was, was added for the public safety end of it, I'm sure this place would get cleaned up very well. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and I was also talking about that 103 freeway, there's land there that can be developed into a green space, which West Long Beach is asking for, you know, they can kill, they can help, you know, saying all three, three, you know, saying birds in one stone with the development of a, a, of a truck resting place with some restrooms there, grass, trees, you know, saying as, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and please everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you touched on the thing of the truck parking, the bathrooms, um, that's a big, big thing with us, oh, you know, yeah. like, yeah. do what's the bathroom situation down there? Okay. Now <laughs> the majority of the terminals have shut down their restrooms, the, the more brick and mortar restrooms, majority of them are closed. Um, I only do my job. I only go to three terminals. They have outhouses for the drivers, you know, so I have to protect myself when I have to use the outhouse and take my Lysol. I've got a case of Lysol in my, under my sink because I can't afford to run out of Lysol. 
you know yeah. what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. You know, unfortunately, I take my Lysol with me, my mask, you know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, when I'm forced to use one of those outhouses and, Are, you know. Do they service them or do they just like let them be? They don't maintain them on a regular basis. What's the deal? Um, their service, you know, and I guess they're legal, but, you know, I look <laughs> at it like this. Huh? Um, their service every day or every other day, you know. Like I said, I, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not forced to use them every day, but, you know, um, I see no problem with the brick and mortar restrooms that they locked up. I mean, if we were, you know, saying a, a longshoreman, if they forced a longshoreman to use outhouses, they would be outraged, mm -hmm. you know, and it wouldn't go down. So why are you treating us like we're third and fifth and 10th class citizens? Yeah. You know, that's how I see it. Yeah. I agree. I agree. It's a human rights issue. There shouldn't right. be bathroom for this one. No bathroom for you. Right. And, and there's no reason to that. The, uh, you even need to have an out. out. We need a real bathroom where yes. we can wash our hands. Right. And right. feel like a decent human being. So when right. you're staging to get into like what what's the turnaround time if you know that you're gonna go get a container what's the turnaround time you have to get okay. a single file line and how's that work oh my goodness i've seen well um i would say that on average if there's a line outside of a terminal for you to go in and, and do a transaction you're looking at two to three hours and if you're outside there's no restroom there's no restroom at, so at you all. so you got to make sure you got like food but not too much food because you might have to go to the bathroom right, right. <laughs> just to, just <laughs> enough to keep the brain functioning not right. too much water even though you need to drink water for your health yeah, yeah. and and then you got to take a break somewhere so you you just gotta hope for the best huh and every day right. is a challenge yes yes and um you know i can you know i have to make sure i have you know saying women's products with me because you know i don't know when i have to you know saying uh, uh i might have a, a small little accident waiting you know and uh till i can get to that restroom or, or you know but i'm me personally i'm fortunate because we just pull we, we actually operate uh they call it inland terminal Mm -hmm. that we just, we just pull we bypass the outside land and we just uh, um they call it peel off where we get a chassis pull up to the machine and loads us and we go out and we go drop at the yard so we're just doing circles all night uh-huh so i'm fortunate you know what I'm saying because at our yards you know what I'm saying i know i need to stop and use the restroom there yeah because, you know it's better than a terminal restroom where i have more of an exposure right yeah, right exactly yeah. yeah so um let me see if i i got my little notepad up here uh okay. the tr the truck parking was the thing and the detention so once you're in the line uh you get you say about three or four hours to turn around on one container yes so you in a in a shift you're really only able to get a, a few, right? Exactly. Exactly. So there's and, uh, the, oh, go ahead. And there's thousands there. So one driver <laughs> is able to move three or four a day, uh, constantly on a constant basis. So much of the time is just waiting, crawling along. It sounds right. like. Right. Yeah. And then uh, different companies, you know, have different versions of the contracts with the drivers you know i have a brother that's also in the industry and um uh, um you know he rolls up and now he's in a um, union company also and so they get uh uh they have bonuses at his his place plus they get the hourly uh -huh. so uh, i think that's a good deal um you know is you know uh um that hourly is is huge though you know it's mm -hmm. really important and, but um, but the, is the bonus based on how many containers he can get in the shift and the, or the bonus is based on how far they deliver. If they deliver uh, to commerce, might be fifteen dollar bonus. If they go out to city industry, 
uh, um, uh, 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 or further uh, San Bernardino, it might be $25 bonus. Okay, gotcha. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it might be nice to get out of there and get a long one, right? Not just for the yeah. bonus, but just to get out of there for a minute. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I could see that. Well, I think we yeah. covered a lot of stuff. I mean, so when you see the news and they're like, oh, it's a it's a truck driver shortage, just a truck driver shortage. What are you what are your thoughts when they say that? Um, um I know that LA has some of the hardest working people in the industry, you know, including myself, <laughs> of course. <laughs> but um, what I see is, you no, know, um, I don't think it's a, a, a driver shortage in particular, other than over the road, you know what I'm saying? Because we don't want, we don't, nobody wants to do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot you of know, over what? the road drivers too. Yeah. There's actually a lot of over the road drivers that would like to be port drivers, but they don't know how to get into it. Um, I even right, wanted to right. do it when I was in Florida and I just couldn't figure out how to get my foot in the door. Um, right. Uh, you know, like I said, I think I need to write a book explaining how the terminals are set up, you know what I'm saying? Because it's all based off a of, of military, you know what I'm saying? Uh, dictates, They're, you know, once you, you figure it out, it's all the same. Uh huh. You know, it's just different shapes and, and, and configurations, but you know, uh uh-uh. uh, I'm thinking about uh, you know I just might have to write a book. Maybe you a little should. pamphlet. Yeah, <laughs> maybe you should. Maybe you should. Well, oh, do you think that we I... covered? Go look look over your notes of all yeah. the little bullet points and see if we covered okay. everything that you want to. Okay. Um. Um. I wanted to touch on minorities and women's with these grants on the electric trucks coming up. Notes are good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, like I said, my experience with the clean air truck program, I was denied, you know, big fat, you know, denied on my paperwork, you know, and, you know, uh, uh, kind of hurt my heart, but, you know, I believe with these upcoming grants, a percentage needs to be earmarked, earmarked for women mm-hmm. and, uh, um, uh, or maybe a curve, you know, for, uh, um, like a, not a learning curve, but a income curve mm-hmm. for those that um are uh, 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 disappropriately you know what I'm saying um unable to to afford it yeah and you know and unfortunately with the last it's going to be one and this one that they're going through now I think is 2.0 these last two you know uh, um clean truck uh, initiatives um the people that I knew growing up that had trucks running, they pre- pretty much got wiped out. Mm. A lot of a uh, 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 black owned small business trucking uh, companies are gone now. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like, you know, uh, um, they, you know, say some, some type of uh, 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 earmark to be made to address this, you know, because like we said that earlier, the bigger companies came up and swiped up, swapped everything up, you know, and mm-hmm. those that were able to, you know, the company that I, I, I got one from, uh, the, 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 the clean truck from, I think out of that whole 100 to 200 trucks, two people finished, completed the list, the, the, the whole term of the lease. And it was the, that driver and they had a, um, a second driver driving the truck also. Mm-hmm. So they got out before the company closed down and uh, took the trucks back. Oh, uh, two people got away with their trucks. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. You know. So this, this survey that we had out um, that was for the electrified trucks, we had a hard time getting any drivers to even take it. So the, the survey was for um, small and minority owned fleets with 20 trucks or less that yeah. would fill out the survey to express why or why not they would <laughs> like to have an electrified truck. Most right. over the road drivers do not understand how this could be relevant to them to keep them um, in this industry when technology evolves. But you yeah. being in Southern California, you see it, you live there, you see that this would help uh, tremendously Southern California, 
um, the congestion, the pollution, everything, but also make you a player still in the right. modern trucking industry that's happening, whether you like it or not, but don't shut us out, us little guys out. So the survey was for that, but uh, the parameters like, are you somebody that uh, has 20 trucks or less and you're the one that has the buying power? Technically, right now, you're a company driver, but you're still interested because this is your livelihood. Um, you know a lot of people that this is their livelihood, and they're interested in being part of the future, not being shut out, um, and, and having these companies come in, and just like they did with the carb stuff, swoop up all the grants and, and um, you know... I don't think it's fair at all. I think I totally agree with you 100%. I'm actually, I want to send this video to the lady that I worked with on that survey. So she's aware because we did have a difficult time getting, we had a lot of people take the survey, but it mm -hmm. wasn't the minorities that we were hoping for. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we got wiped out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that they, they need to be aware that they are, their well-intentioned programs are benefiting the people that exploit the vulnerable, exactly. you know, and they're the hardworking people out there that don't have time to navigate a grant application, you know, like that's, that's not the skill set we have. Right. We can't afford to hire somebody uh, uh, to tell us how to fill it out correctly where we can win. Right, exactly. So, how about how how going back to your your list there? What else did okay. we miss, or did we cover um, everything? Yes. Okay. You let you chuck. Who's who's going to handle the money? Um. Uh, um. I was talking to one of my resources, and they suggested a group like like us, real women of trucking, rather than the banks, to, as a resource to give out some of these grants. Some of us people who are out here doing the work, yeah. um, you know, that idea came through last night. And then, um, let's see, uh, local cities, chassis, education book. Oh, also too, how to fix LA. Um, if all the loads came in on pallets. Pardon? Rather than if they palletized all the loads, uh, coming in on the containers, um, there would be a speedy turnaround for the equipment and it would cost the company more, you know, to ship per, you know, containers, but uh, um, they would get this stuff a whole lot faster. Ah, um, yeah. Cause they bulk it, they bulk, they just shove it all in there as much as they can get in there. Yeah. Yeah. It, Which makes yeah. it a disaster when you open the container because now you got to sort through like all these individual pieces. So I, I actually dealt with something. Uh, I came to get a load of bicycles. This mm -hmm. is a, one of the weirdest loads I ever had in my life. <laughs> I had to go get a port container from Long Beach of, of children's bicycles mm -hmm. that was in a, just all shoved in there, like just all of them, you know, it were no rhyme or reason. As many they could get into the box, they got in the box. Don't open the doors because they're all going to come piling out on top of your head, right? <laughs> and then I had to take them to um, this place in, I want to say, Illinois. Okay. And it used to be um, the place where they made the bicycles, but now they don't make them there anymore. They make them in China. So they, oh, they make them in China. And then they ship them back bulk. And then I'm taking them bulk to where they used to be manufactured only for them to put them in the box. Right. So they're going to take all these bikes out of this bulk container and box them up with their brand and ship them to all these different stores. So I'm like, these bicycles just went a, on a trip across the country so they can now get put in a box and ship back to California and yeah. Arizona and Nevada. Yeah. Like, this is so dumb that uh, they're wasting, they're, they think they're saving all of this money on yeah. shipping, but you're actually wasting money in a different part of shipping by having me truck this crap to the middle of nowhere in a cornfield 
and yeah. then ship it back because it got a box back to where right. it came from. Right. Makes but, no sense. But see, the, um, what they're they're looking at is there's there's a thin line between when you can put something as uh, made in the USA. Um, there's <laughs> time limit, um, you know, like if, if a container sits on the dock, I think it's 30 days, 30, 60 days, something like that then it can be labeled made in the USA. There's certain, <gasps> you know, there's a whole bunch of industry little secrets with that. Oh, wow. You should write a book. I didn't have any <laughs> idea. <laughs> made in the USA if it sits on the dock. So there right. you go. <laughs> that solves that problem. <laughs> right. right. And, um, you know, and like I said, um, you know, with the, um, the they are, the, the, the business, the industry is, attracted to the LA and Long Beach and is why that you know those ships are sitting there because of the the mere volume customs can't keep up with that volume and they they're they're more able to get uh um contraband through they can get away with stuff there that they can't yeah. get away with at, at other ports right. right you know um I'm talking about you know the stuff that you know you buy at the swap meet you know uh the knockoffs the you the know, counterfeit counterfeit yeah. stuff counterfeit brands um um and then we talked about overloaded trailers so a lot of people don't know our trailer has to meet a certain weight axle weight so we've talked about not only contraband counterfeit brands but <laughs> overweight trailers from shippers that are trying to shove that last last bicycle in there and they yeah. know it's overweight but they know the dry it's on the driver's back now so right. once they get it in the container, they know that you got, you can maybe make it to where they need to go. And, right. and we see the trucking industry has been wanting to have heavier trucks for a long time. And, oh, it's going to be good. They say they frame it as, oh, it's going to be good for the environment. And I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, well, it's not good for the driver because a heavier truck is more dangerous to drive and it burns more fuel. So when you go over the grapevine, Mm -hmm. um you you're not you're you're not wanting a heavier truck no. <laughs> you know no. <laughs> that is a nightmare yeah. uh, and and so a lot of these kinds of things that they frame it they frame it as it's going to be oh if we have a heavier truck then we have less trucks on the road that means that we're going to reduce pollution so aren't we great and right. uh, what they really have done is put another straw on the camel's back of the truck driver who's right. risking, you know, the brakes going out on the grapevine or, yeah. or, you know, all their profit burning up in the fuel and, and all of this yeah. kind of thing and getting yeah. a ticket. If the thing is overloaded with what the current regulations are right now by right. Uh, law enforcement. So, right. All right. Um, okay. And last but not least, um, if they, um, how to get more women, uh, in the trucking, um, I think if they would earmark uh, tax breaks for companies to, um, uh, uh, um, you know, and also um, like that group, the three girls trucking, three mm -hmm. girls. Diane Smith. Uh, um, you know, I, I, you know, I would love to to be a, you know, saying something like that, but um, because I'm on my way out, I'm getting old. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, if. You know, I'm a Rolodex of, um, uh, of, you know, problem solving. Yeah. And uh, please feel free to, you know, contact me. You know, um, because for every problem, you know, I, I, that that's me. You know, saying I, I, I work to find a solution. That's just me. That's my my chemistry. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, call me anytime. Or you know, uh, um, Desiree, I love you. Oh, I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, um, I gotta show you something. It took me a while. You, if you can't see my floor right now with the whole floors membership pack. <laughs> and um, I have yours on, I won't show your dress, but um, oh. I have one on here and I have, there's three shirts in here for you. Oh. <laughs> so I have, so um, I'm gonna get this in the mail. It's taken me forever to get these done because 
it's like a whole process. So yeah, we definitely need work with this. I would love to see um, all a lot of us that are getting older that want to start training or opening schools. This is something that I'm really going to be looking into this year. I'm I'm having meetings um, with people about such things. So I'm definitely going to be reaching out to you more. And um, and um, I would love for you to be more involved. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I want to thank you so much for taking this time. I know you work the night shift. So this is actually like your, your little downtime and you're probably a little sleepy and need, maybe need a nap or something before you go to work. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much. I'm going to put this up on our LinkedIn and up on our page and uh, share it with people that want to know what it's like from somebody down in the trenches in the Long Beach port right now. Right, right. There's nothing like local work where you can be in your bed every day, every night. Yeah, yeah. this could actually be a really nice job for a lot of women that think they have to go over the road and they have little kids. If you could yeah. make this, there is no, to, to, to clarify anybody watching this, there's no truck driver shortage, but there is definitely a problem with the training. So yeah. they really do throw people out to the wolves in this. And that's why you have a lot of bad drivers out on the road and there's no tide or retention. So it's kind of like dumb luck, whether you live to tell the tale in a lot of cases. <laughs> and uh, for, for women, they are a, lo a lot more responsible with the equipment. Um, a lot of women, especially single moms, have had to work for everything they have. I know exactly. I mean, you are not trying to waste a thing. And um, so I see that if they made this like a job where they had some kind of real supply chain, this could be good for women that want to go sleep in their own bed at night and use their own bathroom and take a shower every day and they have kids in school and they have their family that they don't want to leave and be out on the road. There's a lot of ports in our country that um, need, uh, uh, they've been modernized. Um, I, I know that I had a man reach out to me about the Savannah port. He said, this is a great job for women, but we never have women apply. I wished Ooh. I would have got his name. I didn't get it at the time, but this year I'm really, I'm really putting some effort towards that way. And I see ports could be a huge potential there. So Tracy, I'm going to talk to you more about this offline for sure. As I, uh, as I work with these other groups to sort of put some sort of a mindset together on that. And the thing with the credit um, um, on the uh, applications for grants, I definitely would like to see, I had actually reached out to a company at one time that had the grants for the APUs and same thing, you know, they got swept up by all the big companies before anybody could get a hold. Hopefully, when we start seeing the electrified trucks, uh, people are aware of our organization now and they would reach out to us to say, yeah, we want to make these available to uh, minority women, women and, you know, women that are business, small business owners, teach them how to become certified um, stuff like that. So these are all things that we're learning to do and looking forward to the future to find others that will help us learn how to, to do this. So very good. Very good. All right, girl. Well, I will talk to you later again. Thank you so much for spending this time. Really appreciate you. And thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Feels good to get it <laughs> off your chest, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it does. Yeah. All right. right. Okay. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay,